Hi, my name is Milan and in today's video we're going to talk about building resilient cloud applications using .NET. I'm going to introduce you to the concept of a resilience pipeline, how we can use it from .NET 8, what the resilience pipeline has to do with Poly, and how all of this fits in with .NET Aspire. So let's jump into the code as we have many examples to cover. I'm going to quickly walk you through the application that we're going to use for this example. I'm using .NET Aspire for orchestration, and we have a Postgres database configured as a resource, a .NET project, which is our Stocks API, which is just a RESTful API that's going to allow us to obtain information about a given stock. And then there is another project called Stocks Real Time, which is responsible for enabling a SignalR connection to interested clients and then publishing messages to the connected clients about stock price updates. Now, if I go into the applications one by one, here is the real-time application. The most important services here are the SignalR Hub, which is called the Stocks Feed Hub. This is how our clients can join a given group. Let me walk into the hub to show you what I mean. So you can join a group for a given stock ticker and then the application will begin streaming stock price updates for that ticker. This is implemented inside of this hosted service which is just a background job and we're going to be spending a bit more time here in a moment so keep that in mind now if i go back to the program there is also a typed http client the stocks api client which is actually talking to the other application that we have which is the stocks api here i'm also using service discovery because i'm running this using aspire so i can use a logical name for this service which actually matches the name that i assigned here so if this was called stocks api123 i could use that name to configure the base address for my stocks api client and then in the actual stocks api project which exposes this one endpoint that we care about which is api stocks and then a given ticker we're going to use the stock service to obtain the latest price and return that from this endpoint now let me go into the background job which is going to start streaming some data for some default tickers. The only value that I assigned here is the Microsoft stock ticker so that I don't overwhelm the console with too much information. And then what the background job does is it first adds the default tickers to the active ticker manager and then it's going to iterate the loop and update the stock prices by some random value. Now I'm also timing this operation for each ticker. And what we are doing here is reaching out to the stocks API using the stocks API typed client to send a get request to the one endpoint that we are exposing. And we're going to get back a stock price response. Then I'm going to log the information that this was a successful request and how long it took. If we run into an exception for some reason, then we're also going to log that message here. And now let me show you how this is working right now by starting the Aspire application. If I open up the Aspire dashboard and navigate into the structured logs, I also set the resource to be our real-time service. And I filter the logs to just show the log from our background job. And you can see that our requests are being sent one by one and every two seconds we get a response which you can see finishes pretty quickly in about 10 milliseconds we reach out to the stocks api service and get a response back and now let's make some interesting changes to the stocks api and see how we can improve the resilience of our service so what we have right now is the ideal scenario in how we want our service to function. Because we are in a local environment, the chances are pretty low that the other API is going to be unavailable and that we end up getting some exception. But in a production environment, you can't guarantee that this is always going to succeed. You could run into network issues, transient failure, and your downstream service could even be temporarily unavailable. And you need to account for this when you are implementing your and you need to account for this when you are implementing your HTTP communication. Now let's go ahead and simulate some sort of problem with our stocks API service. So what we can do here is flip a coin. So I'm going to create a variable that's going to represent my coin. And this is actually going to be just a random value. So I'm going to say random access the shared instance and then get the next double value. And this is going to return a value between zero and one. And I can use this as a probability of how often I want this service to fail. So let's say if the coin is less than 0.3, which is going to equate to about a 30% probability, I want to introduce a delay. So I can say await task delay, and I can specify 5,000, and this is going to introduce a 5,000 millisecond or five second delay on every third API request. So now when I start my application again, and I open up my stock price dashboard, you will see that the logs 
are now coming in at a different pace. The first value here is just for 200 OK, but the second value is how long it took to complete this request. And because of randomness, I'm running into a lot of delays, but you can see that most of my requests end up taking 5 seconds to complete, which isn't really ideal. We are wasting the resources of the real-time service by waiting so long for the response, and also by the time we get back to response, after 5 seconds, it might not be valid to return to our clients. So let's see how we can improve the solution by adding some resilience pipelines into our HTTP client. I'm going to install an additional NuGet package into the real-time application, and this is going to be the Microsoft Resilience package for the HTTP client. So I'm going to look for resilience, and you will see that the most popular packages are the poly ones, and you probably used poly extensions HTTP in the past, but now even this package has a warning that it's deprecated, and you should be using the Microsoft Extensions HTTP Resilience Package. Now, if I click this package, I'm able to single out just this dependency. So I'm going to go ahead and install it, but I'm going to also go back to the resilience filter that I had earlier, and I want to show you something. If you check out the dependencies of this library, you will see that one of the dependencies is Microsoft Extensions Resilience. And if I take a look at that, this is actually depending on Poly. So this is essentially just a wrapper around Poly, which in version 8 of the library got a new API, which is no longer static. There's a bunch of performance improvements that went into this that we won't be diving into, but you will see how this changes the way that we use Poly. Now, what the Microsoft Extensions Resilience package does is it extends the poly library with additional telemetry data. And the HTTP resilience package allows us to easily define resilience mechanisms for the HTTP client. And this is exactly what I want. So let's close this down. And I will go back to my stocks API client. And now I have a new extension method here called add resilience handler. And this allows me to define my resilience pipeline, which I first need to assign a name. So I'm going to call it custom. And then I can access my Resilience Pipeline Builder through a delegate and define my actual Resilience Pipeline. So let's say that it doesn't make any sense for us to wait for a response from the Stocks API after one second. What we can do is add a timeout and we can define how long we want to wait before we want to timeout a request. So let's say that I pass in a time span value of one second, and this is going to end up causing a timeout if my request exceeds one second. So let's start the application again and observe this in action. So you will see our structured log starting to flow in, and sooner or later, one of our requests is going to end up causing a coin flip in the stocks API and run into a delay of five seconds. And then this is going to cause our timeout to trigger, which you can see here, and after 1082 milliseconds, we ended up getting a timeout rejected exception. Now, this time around, we aren't as unlucky with our timeouts on the Stocks API, but you can see that whenever the request time exceeds one second, our timeout policy works as expected, and we end up getting a timeout rejected exception. So this is how we can configure a resilience pipeline around our HTTP clients, and now the next thing we have to do is to extend it to add some more functionality. So let's introduce a retry into our resilience pipeline and before adding the timeout policy. So you can do this by calling add retry, and this accepts an argument of either the retry strategy options with an HTTP response message argument, or you can pass in a new HTTP retry strategy options instance, which basically implements this under the hood. And here I can configure how I want my retry strategy to work. So I'm going to say that the maximum retry attempts are going to be free. And this means that after I send an initial request, which fails, we're going to retry three more times. Then I can define what is going to be my backoff type. The default value for the backoff type is constant, but you can define an exponential backoff where every subsequent retry is going to have a larger delay value, which is meant to give the downstream service more time to recover. So let's use the exponential backoff type. Then I'm going to say use jitter, and I'm going to assign the value of true. And this is going to introduce some randomness 
into how we calculate when we want to send an extra try attempt, and this should be helpful when we have concurrent requests for the same HTTP endpoint to avoid constantly pounding the downstream endpoint at the same time. So the jitter is going to introduce some randomness into the delay. And then for the actual delay, we can define what is the delay we want to wait. So let's say we want to wait, for example, 500 milliseconds after each of our retry attempts plus the exponential back off and the random jitter. Now I'm also going to update our API endpoint to throw an exception if the coin value is less than 0.2. So there is a 20% probability that we're going to throw an exception and let's say stocks API is unavailable. So with these two changes in place, let's go ahead and start our application again. So you will see our HTTP requests starting to flow to the stocks API. And every now and then, you're going to see an HTTP request taking a bit longer than the other ones. This is because we are running into a retry, which is causing our request to take longer. You can see this one here run into a few retry attempts, which is why it took 3000 milliseconds. Now there is a slight chance that a given retry attempt is going to expand all of the retries, which is the initial request, plus three more retries, and in that case, we're going to get an exception. So right now, you can see that just by adding a timeout, we improve the responsiveness of the real-time service, and by adding a retry to the HTTP client, we also improve the reliability. So now every time an HTTP request takes longer than a second, we're going to stop it, and retry that request again, hoping that next time we send a request is going to succeed. But there's also another thing that we can do, and that is adding a total request timeout for our HTTP request. So you can see that sometime when we send our requests, they might exceed, I believe, three seconds, which you can see here, and let me check the newest request down here. So usually after a few retries, they end up succeeding. So let's make a change like this. I'm going to make an update to say that there is a 50% probability that we're going to run into some performance issues and we're going to add a five second delay. And then inside of our resilience pipeline, I'm also going to add a timeout, let's say here, and this timeout will apply to all of our requests, including any retries. So let's say we have a timeout of five seconds to complete this request. And then we have our retry policy and then a per request timeout of one second. So let's see what happens now when I start the application. Here is our stream of API requests and you can see that this one encountered a few retries. Now, eventually one of these requests is going to end up spending all the retry attempts, which is free retries, or is going to run into the timeout limit for all of our API requests, which is five seconds. And this is exactly what happens here. So here you can see a request that took 5,055 milliseconds and we got a timeout rejected exception. And this is our total request timeout working as expected. So in this example, we are giving our HTTP client a chance to retry the request a few times and eventually is going to exceed the timeout limit for the total number of requests. And this is why we get a timeout rejected exception. Now, if I keep scrolling down, you will see this exception here. And this is because we ran into the exception from the API, which could simulate some downtime on the API instance. And then if I keep scrolling down, you will see that we have a few more requests that have failed, but overall, the majority of our requests is successful. But let's take it to the extreme now and simulate that our API service is down for some reason. And I'm going to do that by assigning a 99% probability that we're going to throw an exception, which is going to cause a large number of retries from the real-time service. So let's start this. And if I check out my structured logs, you will see that all of them are running into the HTTP request exception. The total request time is between one and three seconds. And this is because we have our back off plus the random jitter, but eventually all of our requests are going to fail because we simulated that our stocks API service is unavailable. Now in this situation, it will be helpful to somehow prevent the real-time service to continue sending requests to the API service because it's unavailable. And there is a resilience policy that does exactly this. So after the retry policy, I'm going to introduce another policy called a circuit breaker. You can add it by calling add circuit breaker and we're going to pass in a new 
HTTP circuit breaker strategy options. And here we also have to configure a few values. The first one that I'm going to configure is the sampling duration. This represents a time window for how long we want to sample our requests. So let's say the sampling duration is 10 seconds. Over these 10 seconds, we're going to sample our HTTP requests. And if the failure ratio exceeds a given threshold, let's say 90% of requests fail in these 10 seconds, then we want to open the circuit, which is going to prevent any further requests being sent to the downstream service. You can also configure the minimum throughput, which is the minimum number of requests that you want to process before enforcing the circuit breaker. And we can also configure the break duration by setting some time span. Let's say the circuit breaker should be open for five seconds. So now when I start the application, with the circuit breaker policy configured, you will see how this changes the overall behavior. So you can see our first request completes after 2.2 seconds or 2000 milliseconds. And then after that, we are getting the broken circuit exception. And you can see this completes very quickly. This fails after 13 milliseconds. So in this example, we are no longer sending the request to our downstream service. Instead, we are waiting for the circuit to close. And how this works with the circuit breaker strategy is after five seconds expires, which is our break duration, the circuit breaker is going to send a so-called probe request to the downstream service. And if this request succeeds, then it's going to close the circuit, which is going to allow us to continue sending API requests. Now, in this example, we are running into the extreme situation where the downstream service is unavailable. So our circuit breaker is constantly in the open state, preventing our application from sending unnecessary requests. You can see here that every few requests, one of them takes between 400 and 600 milliseconds. And this is actually our retry policy working behind the scenes, but eventually it exceeds the threshold for the circuit breaker policy, which causes the broken circuit exception. So now I want to dial this back a little. Let's say there is a 30% probability that we run into an exception, and let's keep the delay to a 50% probability. Now, another thing I want to do is to comment out our custom policy that we have here. And this is because there is another extension method that I didn't show you yet, and that is the standard resilience handler. This is going to more or less configure what I just showed you here. I'm going to show you exactly what this does in a moment, but the standard resilience handler is going to introduce some default resilience policies that are recommended by Microsoft. So let's start the application. And now if we observe our API requests, you will see that most of them are succeeding. And behind the scenes, our standard resilience policy is working. And here you can see a request taking four seconds. This is because we end up retrying it a few times. And here's another request taking five seconds. But after that, our HTTP requests recover and we keep getting the response back pretty quickly. So what does the standard resilience pipeline actually do to allow us to make our HTTP requests more resilient? If we check out the documentation for the standard resilience pipeline, you will see that it consists of five resilience strategies. The first one is a rate limiter that only allows a given number of concurrent requests. Then we have a total request timeout strategy followed by a retry strategy, a circuit breaker, and then a timeout strategy for a given attempt. And this is basically what we configured by hand. So this is what the standard resilience handler gives you. Now, there is also the standard hedging handler. And what this is going to do is it's going to hedge against your API requests failing by sending a few requests in parallel with the hope that one of those requests will succeed quickly and then it can return the result of that request as the response. Now it's important to be aware of how this actually works and you might not want to use this if the API endpoint that you are calling is not idempotent. Now, if you are using .NET Aspire, you don't really have to do any of this. And this is because if you go into the service defaults project, there is a call here that's configuring some default for all of your HTTP clients. And one of those is adding the standard resilience handler. The other one is configuring service discovery. So this is one of the cool things that I like about .NET Aspire is that it introduces some very nice defaults to make your cloud applications more resilient. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure to smash the like button and leave a comment below. And if you want to learn more about working with .NET Aspire, then you should watch this video next. Check out my clean architecture and modular monolith courses to improve your skills. And until next time, stay awesome.